Hi Juan, thank you so much for joining us. A real pleasure to have you with us and our audience. So first of all, help us to understand who is Juan, who is behind his name. Juan is somebody who is completely confused. Um, I had no idea when I grew up in Mexico that I'd end up in science. I had no idea it would be gene research. I had no idea now it would be the brain. Uh, I was interested in completely different things, but the, the thing that I think has helped me throughout my life is I'm very curious and I go pretty deep on subjects when I get very curious about them. I'm really fascinated by your vision on, like you call that disruption of life. Mm -hmm. So probably it's rooted in this new binary code that gets embedded in life and changes everything. So what's disruption in life? So we're perpetually getting the code in our bodies, the DNA, mm -hmm. recoded. So it's being edited. So let's imagine for a second that you go down to Central America and a flying hypodermic needle comes through the air. It's called a mosquito. Mm -hmm and it bites you right here. And in the process of feeding itself, what it's doing is it's inserting a new gene code into your body. And that gene code gets into your cells and begins to produce malaria. And then the cells infect other cells and they break apart and you come down with a horrible disease and mm -hmm. you come down with you know, fever and chills and everything else. But in essence, what that mosquito has done is it's inserted gene code into you mm -hmm. and reprogrammed your body to be a factory for malaria. Mm -hmm. So when another mosquito bites you, it's going to take that and reinfect something else. Yep. We're doing the same thing now, but we're doing it with a much more positive purpose. Okay. We've learned gene code well enough that we can create vaccines very quickly against all kinds of diseases. We've learned gene code well enough that we can retool the immune system of your body to fight cancer. We've learned gene code well enough that we can begin to address some really deadly genes, gene diseases. And that's just the beginning of this adventure of mm -hmm. moving from digital code to life code. So um, how do you foresee within this vision of life is code, so when it's coded, we can actually hack it, disrupt it for good or for bad. How do you foresee the future of biology, like in five years? So biology is just so interesting these days because we've moved from the period where biologists basically used microscopes or used magnifying glasses to observe stuff and then made little notations, you know, the bird lifted its blue foot three inches off the ground and then the other bird moved its beak down. That used to be biology, and it, it took enormous amounts of talent and, and brilliance to, to understand what that meant and how you create a theory of evolution out of that observation. But today's biology is very different because we're not observing evolution, we're guiding evolution. So whereas it used to be that natural selection, smarter, faster, tougher, used to win, Today what we're doing is we're practicing unnatural selection. Mm -hmm. I don't want people with bad eyesight to die because they can't see the lion, so I'm going to have glasses. I don't want people with diabetes to die, so I'm going to create artificial insulin. I don't want people to die of the diseases that used to kill most people, so I'm going to create vaccines. And when you do that, you greatly improve the quality of life for humans, but you're also unnaturally selecting, mm -hmm. just as you're doing when you're farming. I would like this to have a whole lot of cows and not a lot else. I would mm -hmm. like this to have a whole lot of corn and not a lot else. If, if you left it to nature, that landscape would look very different. But we've terraformed half of the surface of Earth. Mm -hmm. And that means we're practicing and guiding evolution. It's not nature doing that. And that's an enormous responsibility. That's a superpower. Some, some personal questions. I mean, each time I, I look at what you're doing, it's like, oh, I would love to be Juan. It's like, he's doing amazing, look, actually not one project, like a bunch of, of different crazy projects. What's your wildest dream now? What's your craziest project you're on now? So I spent the last 25, first 
20 years of my professional life thinking I was going to fix Mexico and help run it. I was determined to reduce violence, reduce poverty, etc. My life got completely disrupted. I ended up in science, and for the last 25 years I've been thinking about gene code and organizing the code and the language of life. Mm -hmm. The next 20 years, I'm going to continue doing the life stuff, but I'm going to move more and more into the brain. Okay. So what I'd love to do over the next 20 years, and my dream for the next 20 years, is to understand what makes us us. Because basically, this is you, and the rest is just packaging. Your, your life doesn't change because you lose an arm. Your life doesn't change because you have a heart transplant. But boy, you lose your brain. You've lost yourself. And that, I think, is one of the greatest adventures that we can be on. So I'm the father of, of three uh, young kids. When I look at this world, I mean, it really depends on the moment, but it's like, is there like, wow, this is amazing. We can do anything we want as ever before. Or, oh my God, this is like really, really complex, gloomy, etc. When you look at the world, like, forget about the born optimistic Juan. Like, what's your biggest concern when you look at this world? So, there's three things that I, I think we really have to address in a serious way. The, the first is climate change. Um, I think we're really underestimating the risk of climate change. I think we are going to have to move most of the world's large cities and maybe even countries mm -hmm. over the next decades. I'm not saying centuries, I'm saying decades. decades yep. and you know, that is going to be a challenge like very few. And if we don't get that right, we're going to have huge wars over territory, over water, over refugees, over a whole series of things. So I think when you start building critical infrastructure, like hospitals, like power plants, like schools, you, you should not be building them unless if they're 20 meters, 60 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. at a minimum, maybe higher. And that begins to give you a parameter for how you have to start thinking about this. Then the second thing we've got to do is we've got to address the acid rain and the methane emissions that are coming out of places like Siberia and mm -hmm. out of the developing world. So climate change is one. The second thing which I think we're underestimating is one nuclear bomb can really ruin your entire day you know, really will disrupt your agenda. And we're creating more nuclear weapons in more unstable countries. Mm -hmm. And we have to take nuclear proliferation really seriously. The third one is something people don't think about. When you see these pretty pictures of space, and you see these nebulae, and you see these supernova and the rest of the stuff, basically what's happening is you're blowing up entire solar systems by the hundreds, by the thousands. So they're very pretty pictures. But in essence, you've wiped out hundreds of thousands of solar systems. The space is a really nasty place, and this is a real outlier in space. So unless if we diversify the human species off this planet mm -hmm. to other planets, to other solar systems, it's pretty clear that we and all life on this planet is going to go extinct. In millennia or tens of millennia, it's not tomorrow, it's not next yep. century, but we have to get human beings off this planet mm -hmm. for humans to be able to survive extinction level events on mm -hmm. a space scale. Uh, last question. Uh, actually, we're closing all this conversation with the same silly game. Imagine this is like a magic wand. Juan, I give it to you, you take it. So now Juan has a superpower to change anything he wants on planet Earth, but just one thing. What would Juan change? So, 
I'm going to hyphenate it and make it two. I want people to be curious and empathetic. I think the golden rule of treat others the way you want to be treated yourself is a place where all religions seem to be converging. Mm -hmm. The major religions, there's obviously offshoots. It seems to be a place where humanists are converging. It seems to be a place where human rights organizations and governments are converging. So that gives me optimism, and I think it's a very good guiding principle for ethics, and I'd like us to converge on that, but I don't want us to lose our curiosity because the thing that makes us the dominant species on Earth at this point is we've never lost our curiosity and our will to explore. Mm -hmm. So let's treat others with kindness and let's not lose that curiosity, that insatiable need to see what's over the next ridge, the next valley, the next mountain. That's the essence of humanity. That has been really amazing. Probably I would stay here for 24 more hours. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been, been a pleasure for us and hope we can talk very soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>